Hello and welcome to Off Track, the motorcycle racing podcast. I'm your host, Dave Neal. What a fantastic place to start a podcast from. This is the most incredible place we have ever had a podcast so far, and it's an absolute privilege. Ben Curry, my co-host alongside me. Ben, why don't you introduce the guest? No problem, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here again. Our guest today has one of the biggest names in motorcycle racing across the world. In the early years of his career, he was son of a famous Grand Prix racer trying to pave and create his own legacy in the sport. With natural ability, he soon made his mark on the World Superbike stage, securing five wins, 45 podiums on his way to runners-up in the 2010 World Superbike Championship. He eventually came back to conquer the British Superbike Championship in 2018, and at 39 years old, I hope he doesn't mind me saying that, he is still at the top of the sport. Alongside it all, he's running a massive eight-rider academy team at national level and now venturing into running a fully-fledged British Superbike team. He's here to tell us all about, and I cannot wait, ladies and gentlemen, Leon Haslam. Oh, that's outstanding. What an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Leon, welcome to the show, mate. What an absolute pleasure. No, mate, it's good to be here. You know, it's, uh, it's been a busy old winter, but uh, it's finally all coming together and calming down a little bit now. That is the singular best introduction I've ever heard on <laughs> Off Track. <laughs> well, I'm going to need a tear off or a new jacket or something because I'm sweating now. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting used to this slowly but surely, mate. It's only your third show so you're not doing bad and congratulations that was meant thanks i'm growing into it i'm starting to enjoy it you know relaxing at least i got a good mate by my side here to if uh he's not going to be kind to you, you know? if i if it was someone else i might have been a bit more nervous but at least i feel a bit comfortable here i'm familiar surrounding so we're all good <laughs> leon nail him <laughs> you I, have, thought, I thought that intro was amazing it's a lot better than his racing career wasn't it you there you go you see here he is he's, he's, back. <laughs> he's here it didn't take him long this morning he come in like an absolute sheep in the gym with his tail between his legs he's like, oh, i've had a late night you know uh, it's a long day <laughs> you were away till two in the morning so you know you've got reason for that got to work haven't we he's well some of us have <laughs> as i said he's running the team now he can't be uh Laying in till late mornings and letting everyone do the things for him. He's got to do it himself now. That's, yeah, what a turnaround. We'll talk more about that later on. But um, thank you for letting us come into your, your museum. It is just incredible. So much history here from your dad and from your racing. I mean, what is it like for you? You train up here as well. What more motivation do you need to, to get up in the morning? Yeah, obviously from my side... Um I've been very lucky, you know, traveling the world with my dad in Grand Prix, you know, being brought up as a, a racing family, having ex racers live here 24 seven, riding, playing, doing silly things. It's, it's kind of been my life. So, you know, I feel very privileged for that. But yeah, obviously to be able to see it on the walls or the history, the what my dad's achieved, what we've achieved. And uh, obviously then trying to help the youngs riders out, do the fitness testing here. It's uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. What's your favorite bit of memorabilia while we're up here? Uh, we've not actually kept many bikes, but I got my very first one, two, five stuck up on the wall. Um, so yeah, a lot of good memories. That was just kind of me and my dad running out of the back of a van and, you know, the early days, uh, was pretty cool. And obviously, yeah, a lot of good memories from each of the years with obviously the Suzuki leathers and, you know, certain leathers have a lot of bad memories, but at the same time, that kind of brings you to where you are now. So yeah, a lot, lot of history. Which, okay. Which do you wince about the most when you look at them? If you're looking for the, the, let's look at the downside. Before Straight in, yeah. Side. Straight in. Before we go to the good side, yeah. <laughs> let's start low and then we can lift it and finish <laughs> on a crescendo. The Italjet leathers was a very bad year for me. Um, I'd, that was my first year in GPs. Uh, I was only 15. Um, I had to live in Italy pretty much on my own at 15 in this little flat. Um, it was the first year for Italjet in the in the uh, GP championship. Uh, I think we blew up in 14 races out of the 16 and... First round in Suzuka, it seized in sixth gear, broke my ankle. So it was a very knocking introduction to MotoGP. Um, I even had to come back to England to try and find a bit of confidence, do a bit of riding. And yeah, when you look at it in a hole and those leathers, I can just remember a lot, a lot of crashing and a lot of uh, a lot of big engine failures, I would say. That's, that's some opportunity at 15 years old, isn't it? Especially as you've not been mm. road racing for too long because you'd made you obviously you'd started on the um on the motocross side of things but then to go and end up in a in a grand prix paddock at 15 years old mm. very very different to the the young riders that are there now with the support network they get mm. you're kind of just like there you go leon yeah it was a very fast thing you know um in 1997 i jumped from motocross to um road racing i was actually on a scooter I had me and james tozen in the scooter championship and 98 was my first year on a 125, which is the bike up there. Uh, 99, I did European Championship and Spanish Championship. And in 2000, I was in uh, GP. So from a 
motocross to scooters to two years later in GPs, it was a bit of a fast learning curve. I was actually quite fascinated when I did some, a little bit of research, obviously knowing you personally, but without actually like the full story behind Leon Haslam as a motorcycle racer. And, um, it wasn't a, it was a quick introduction into road racing. Obviously your dad was fully into it. Did that help pave the way? <clears throat> I think it was, um, it was difficult. A lot of people assumed that we was getting a lot of support. So when my dad ran Team Great Britain, uh, obviously he ran myself. Uh, a lot of people assume now oh, we're getting factory bikes, we're getting all the sponsors, and it wasn't the case. You know, it, it was difficult, and uh, I know my dad put a lot of money and time into it. And the opportunity with a Taljet obviously wasn't the best, but it was the only opportunity. And um, my dad was a firm believer just to throw me in the deep end. So you know, talking about that as a big step, my third year in racing, I was in GPs. My fourth year in racing, I was on a 500 V twin against Valentino Rossi. So talking about making big steps and learning the hard way for me, it was a fast, but you know, very, very hard. I would say start because we never had a year of winning because anytime I got close to the front of anything, we was thrown into the next thing. So those early years was difficult. You often hear those horror stories of people making the step into Grand Prix racing or world Superbike, And you hear those horror stories of when they start out, they, they bring a load of money to the team or the team's not quite performing on the level that you would expect for that level of racing. Um, obviously with your dad's support um, and, you know, guidance as such, did he help get through that stage with it more on the personal level, like mm. dealing with things at that level or did he sort of step back and sort of go, there you go, son, it's, it's up to you. I think he found it hard. Um, it was only since I've obviously become a dad myself. I, I never really understood it from the outside, but I, I remember stories that he used to tell, especially with the Italjet. Um, I'll never forget the first round of the championship. Uh, the 125s back then used to have a detonation light that used to tell you when the bike was going to seize up and throw you off, basically. And on the warm up lap of the race, like we stood on the grid, first Grand Prix in Japan. And this light's flashing its head off and it's like, we'll come up to the grid. I said to the guys, oh, we need to jet up. It's, it's going to seize. We'd, we'd, we'd had a few issues. And um, the boss of the team just come and got some duct tape and duct tape the light up. And that was it. So my dad, being my, my dad, knowing that it's probably going to seize and throw me off, couldn't say anything because he's my dad. So the experience that he's got having to bite his tongue was, I know now was obviously really hard for him. And I've been my old, you know, four laps later, I seized and broke my ankle, you know, and, as a dad, I think I would have to say something. And because he's probably been brought up of having uh, the dad's probably interfering too much, you know, he didn't want to be a racer dad. You know, he wanted to try and help and, you know, do what was right. And and that throughout my whole career has always been a factor. You know, I don't see my dad as a racer dad. I just see him as a very positive help for me. And I know he's very conscious of not being that person that, you know, even now I've got you know, 10 riders and 10 dads to work with and, and they are a pain in the arse, you know, that, that's generally what they, what is the case. And I know that my dad was very conscious of not wanting to be that person and in them situations, I know it was kind of tough. Looking at the next step when you moved up into 500cc GP with the Shell Advance team, for me, that's a fascinating time because you were teammates with Chris Walker. Mm. He just won, he'd come, sorry, just come second in the mm. British Superbike Championship to Neil Hodgson. Mm. And I remember reading his book and the issues that he had, he wasn't allowed to move anything on the bike. It's a Honda, go and ride it. Did you experience those same restrictions? From my side of it, I didn't have any problems because I had no experience. Um, I was 17. I just got off a 125 of the year that I just had. Um, I rocked up at a test on a V-Twin 500 and I was loving life. You know, we was living in SRT. It was just great. Um, Riding side of it, I think I crashed twice every weekend, but it didn't matter. I was on a V-twin, there was no pressure. Um, my actual results was quite competitive. Uh, and obviously, Chris, obviously at the time where he was at, he was he was expected to perform, you know, he was the lead rider. Um, the bike that year for him was, wasn't was the best, you know, it, it had its issues and he was very super bike related. So I know it didn't work out for him in that year. Uh, I got upgraded to the V4 halfway through the year and just crashed its brains out. But from my point of view, for how hard that was and, and all the injuries that I got that year, I learned more that year than I've ever, ever done. And, um, you know, having the likes of Lars Caparossi and Rossi and Alex Barros coming to me with their data and helping. And as a 17 year old kid with, you know, all I did was just twist the throttle as hard as I could. It was, uh, 
there's a lot to learn and a lot of injuries, but you know, I could have stopped in England and become British champion, but I learned more that year by doing what I did, being with HRC. It was, um, you know, definitely a massive learning curve. As just before I just drop you in on there, Ben, as one of the, I guess one of the few remaining riders that's ridden an NSR 500. Well, up until Rossi retiring, we was the last two people to ride a 500 two straight, and now he's retired. I'm the I'm the last remaining. So there you go. That's that's fantastic. <laughs> I, kind of, the, I didn't think there were many left, but I think you were the last one to actually have ridden an NSR 500. Mm -hmm. And when you you kind of my age, and you've grown up through the Rothmans Honda years, mm -hmm. and you've seen Wayne Gardner, Freddie Spencer, Mick Doohan, what is an NSR 500 like to ride? Honestly, I, I probably underestimated it when I first went there, but there's certain place if people's ever rode Bruno, I remember high side in there in fifth gear. And so it's a, it's a place that at the point that it, I crashed, you shouldn't even be able to crash, but it had that much power. And it was such like a light switch. You, you could never underestimate like on how aggressive it could be. And um, just when you think you're all good and you're on a straight and you twist the throttle, you, you just can't do that, you know? And at any point it can high side you and, and, and I did several, several times. So yeah, it, it was, and it was amazing. And coming from a one, two, five, where you do just twist it as hard as you can to having that amount of power, two stroke, the light bike, it was, um, yeah, it was a big, big learning curve. Could you appreciate it enough at the time of the history that you were riding? Or do you look back now and think, damn, that was pretty cool. It was amazing. And looking back, I would not change it. Um, now, in what I've experienced through my career, I, I could have approached it in a probably a lot better way. Uh, I felt a little bit unfortunate at the same time because it was the last year of the two strokes. So, you know, I actually was a top V-twin rider, you know, got in top tens in my first year as a 17 year old, but the year after everything went four strokes. A lot of the teams disappeared because they didn't all go with the four stroke way. Uh, so I had to come back to basically back to two fifties off the back of that. And at the time, you know, I was a little bit disappointed because I felt that this is where I want to be. This is what I wanted to do. And I never got to stay in that paddock on, on the, on the full factory motor GP bike. Which is a shame. Then it was at the NSR 250 that you went to. After yes. That. Yeah. Which is still an, an incredible motorcycle to ride. Yeah. No, I got to ride one, two, five, two fifty and five hundreds in GP, uh, and into three, four seasons. And, um, you know, for me, it was a transition point to four strokes. Uh, at that point I'd never rode a four stroke. So after I did my GP three years, I actually come back to England on a, on a Ducati four stroke to learn a four stroke. And I remember um, getting a little 748 Ducati and doing track days. And at the time I'd not even done a track day in my whole career because I'd gone straight to Worlds. Um, so I had to get my road license. I had to <laughs> do all the things that you did. And I'd, and I'd been in World Championship for three years. So it was a kind of a weird transition just to learn how to ride a four stroke. Yeah. Incredible, Ben. Um, yeah, not to jump too far back, obviously on that one, but um, you said about, how when you were new to the to the class you mm -hmm. had a bit of a blank canvas you got to start from scratch so it didn't matter too much mm -hmm. about you know what you could or couldn't change on the bike mm -hmm. obviously you mentioned how you could have a look at valentino rossi's data and all these sorts of things growing up through the sport and seeing mm -hmm. things change a lot or sh my question should be have you seen it develop and change so much because you've you've kind of you're in a bit of a crazy era there when you've gone two strokes to four strokes you're now on modern day super bikes with traction control and all this crazy stuff mm. how has that been sort of like developing through that and seeing all the new riding styles coming through and all that sort of stuff yeah i think when you look at back at the era of the 500s the two strokes i would say it would be 75 percent the rider that produced the result what was going on where now i believe it's more about the package that the electronics guy that you've got next year what manufacturer that you're on at any given year um it's took a little bit away from the riders still it's a lot about the riders as in you know it's gone to a new level on how they're riding now elbows down and, and all the stuff because they're maximizing something that's a lot more i would say developed refined where the rawness of a two stroke 500 with no electronics it was purely down to the rider, you know, and, you know, the, the crashes that they had, the high sides, the being able to be on top of your game to keep that confidence to ride at that level, where nowadays, you know, how many high sides do you see? You know, it, it allows a different approach, it allows it to be a more aggressive, it allows you to ride it in a, I would say, a more youth, youthful uh, attack mode, where back in the day it was, you had to respect it and, and learn your trade to be able to compete at that level. What era do you think, uh, looking back on it, is the toughest 
era of racing. Obviously, you've you've seen a, a fair bit now, mm. like you just mentioned with the modern era. You know, mm. riders are fitter. Mm. Um, they're trying to maximize every little last tenth. Yeah. However, hearing that with the two stroke days and stuff mm. like that, saying that it was seventy five percent rider, that to me mm. seems that potentially mm. those days were harder than now. But is it black and white in that sense? I think it's. I feel it was harder back then for the rider because it was more about them and it was about uh, self-analyzing, adapting yourself. And today now you can be the best rider ever. And if the electronics aren't working and you're twisting the throttle and you're doing what you can, it, it kind of determines your result. Um, so you can get lost by not quite having the right package, I would say nowadays, where in my dad's era and, and the start of my career, you didn't have to be on the best bike and you could make the difference as a rider. I think nowadays, no matter how good you are, you need the package to win. And, you know, a perfect example was Alvaro jumping from the Ducati to the Honda, you know, should have won it in 19, got on the factory HRC bike and finished equal on points with me, you know, and then he went back to Ducati and won the world championship. So he didn't get good and bad overnight in those years. It was about the package, about what was underneath him. And, and I think back in the day, no matter which bike you went to, you could make the difference as a rider. You might not win a championship, but you'd be second or third if, if you was capable. Do you think there's some exceptions in the sport where, you know, we see some riders that have that freak mm. natural ability. The first person that sticks to mind, obviously, is Marquez, the way he rides those bikes. And he's arguably on the most inferior MotoGP bike at the moment, but can still put it on the podium. Does that sort of like take away that whole theory? There is a little bit, but then that is the exception. You know, the, the, there's a someone that can, and also when someone goes with his ability, you're not going as like a second rider in a team if you're Mark Marquez. That team is going to own in to give you what is needed. The issues that you get, you can get a very good riders go into teams that are a second rate rider in that team at that time. So the emphasis isn't on them. The emphasis on, you know, uh, who's doing the business the year before and they're continuing with that and they're introducing a new rider. So all of a sudden, you know, I, I had it very much when I went to Kawasaki with, with Jonathan, you know, six times world champion. I come back from British Championship to Worlds and that bike was capable of winning. He proved it six years in a row. But it was proved to be winning on if you rode it like Jonathan Ray. You know, that team was in it for, for him to ride it that way. That wins races. So me coming there, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll completely change my style. I'll ride it that way. And if I had a three-day test, I could adapt myself to half match Jonathan at a track. But at a race weekend where you've got two 40 minute sessions to adapt my natural style, to ride the Kawasaki like Jonathan, just because then that is a proven winning package was very difficult in year one. You know, I needed another year to kind of like understand how to ride it, learn and, and progress from that. And I think a lot of people who make the jump, a lot of teams are that way. They've got a way of, it needs to be ridden. And to, as a rider, that's sometimes difficult where you know, with the electronics and everything else, I did need to ride it that way because that's how it was set up. But to try and figure that as a rider is sometimes difficult. Do you think um, to sort of hone in on that point a little bit about, because that I feel like Johnny's kind of an exception in World Superbike Absolutely. as well. And he's on the same, you can't really put the two riders on the same um, pedestal as such because it's completely different disciplines with Marquez in MotoGP and, mm. and Johnny in World Superbike. But right now we're seeing a change of the, you know, changing the guard in, in a sense where Ducati's now starting to come on top of the world in both classes. Mm. Do you think maybe um, Kawasaki's downfall and Honda's HRC's in MotoGP has been, they have put so much focus into a freak of nature mm. that now new riders are coming along like Mia, mm. um, Polo Spargo, no mugs to, to riding a motorcycle. Mm. Has that been their downfall? Because now all of a sudden we're seeing new riders taking it to another level again, that their development is almost stuck or behind a little bit in that sense. I think the issues that you're talking about there is, is Mark has been capable of winning. So people at HRC, for instance, with Mark and, and Kawasaki with Jonathan, they've been winning with whatever they've been doing and everyone else has moved on. Not necessarily there's better riders on other manufacturers than them, but the manufacturer has been trying to beat Mark Marquez. So Honda's been winning, John has been winning with Cowie. And that bike's pretty much not really moved on like everybody else. Everyone else has been trying to beat them and they've progressed and moved on. 
Now, John Lee's riding the best he's ever ridden. Um, but, you know, Ducat is now beating him, you know, and that's because Ducat has progressed and the package with him and Alvaro, they've got a better package, I believe. And, and that's why the results are the way they are. And it's the same with Mark, you know, when you sit back in racing, you know, everyone improves every year. And if you don't make those steps, you will not only not be winning, he'll be fourth or fifth, sixth, sixth. You know, it's easy to drop back. And I think when you've got someone very, very talented, you still need that drive to keep progressing. And, you know, eventually it catches up with people that obviously emphasize all the results on, on a very talented rider like Johnny or, or Mark Marquez. Do you see yourself a, a little bit swapping and changing between World Superbike and BSB? Mm. Obviously it's a lot to take in. People at home might not realize the difference between in, in machinery mm. from a World Superbike to a British Superbike, for instance. Sure. Last year was a tough year for you. Mm. Um, you came back on the Lee Hardy race in Kawasaki. Mm. Um, have you suffered in the past from that where um, potentially making a change in, in, in championships has hindered your results? I, there's two things with it. Um, you know, every year when I've been in England, I was jumping back and forth to Japan doing Suzuka testing. I always did two or three wild cards. And actually the hardest transition is from World Superbike back to England because you, you ride a bike very, very differently with traction control, with anti-wheelie, and the, and the level of team of, you know, 40 staff per rider versus, you know, one or two guys working on it in a BSB. Your mentality changes, the tracks are different, no electronics. So being able to adapt your riding style between those two, the hardest transition is World Superbike to British Superbike, no doubt. Um, you know, last year was probably one of my worst enjoyable years I've ever had. And I did... BSB, World Endurance, Suzuka, IDM, um, you know, World Superbike. I, I think I did 15 weekends in a row last year. And the most fun that I ever had was Suzuka and IDM because I was just riding the wheels off of something with no pressure. You know, it was kind of a enjoyable things where the other concepts, if it was the rides that I got in World Superbike or even in BSB, no matter what I did as a rider, I wasn't going to be competitive. And I find, at my point in my career, I found that really hard. And my natural instinct to just push harder resulted in me crashing loads. So from 2018, where I won 15 races and never had one crash in any race, where last year I was rolling around in tents with Sykesy and crashing every single weekend. And the difference is you're just pushing over yourself because fundamentally what you've got underneath you is just not going to be capable. Do you feel the pressure moving later into your career to, to perform? You've got you know, years aren't on your side, it, mm. you know, mm. I know you probably think you can ride to your hundred, but mm. that's just your mentality. But mm. the reality is the years aren't on your side. Mm. Does that put an extra bit of pressure on you or does it take it off and you actually relax and you think, Do you know what, I've done a lot. Yeah, I think it was difficult. You know, when I went, when I won in 18, I got a factory KRT ride and the pressure come back on because I wanted to perform. And, and in my head, I didn't know I was going to get an opportunity to go back. Uh, off the back of that, I did two years with HRC. Um, and I've come back in 2021 and, and back to England in 22. Um, and I know that I'm not pushing to be in a world seat. I know that if there was an opportunity, I still think I can be competitive, but I'm not going to get that opportunity to be, to be competitive. So in my head now, I want to maximize what I'm doing. I know my experience and my speed's good enough to win in England. I've got to create a package to do that. Um, so a lot of people are like a point proving, you know, even when I go to Suzuka now and I'm teammates with Johnny Ray and Alex Lowe's and when you go there and there's three people on one bike, you want to be the top dog. You want to push as hard as you can. And my role changed. I know I'm fast enough. You know, the, the lap times was quick and we was as quick as anyone there, but I wasn't going there to be the quickest. I was there to do a role, to be consistent, to unite everybody. And I actually enjoyed that. You know what I mean? I, to have the, to go somewhere and not have the pressure to be the number one and, and it's hard, you know, and that, that's, for me, I know my my ability, I know my worth. And if I can create a package now in England and, and prove that amazingly, you know, and that's kind of my aim now. Does this bring you to a point in your career? And I want to just, I don't know when this podcast going out or dropping certain things. However, it's kind of shaping up to be the perfect time for you to mm. start taking things into your own hands. Mm. Um do you see yourself at the perfect point now to, with your backing, with your name, your f the family's history, mm. obviously the academy team, do you see this now as the perfect opportunity to start a fully fledged British superbike team now 
maybe do a couple of years, mm. develop the team, mm. bring it to a high standard and then take a step back and watch it. Is this kind of shaping up to be this kind of time of your career? Yeah, honestly, when I uh, set Affinity Sports Academy up, um, it was when I won in 18, I originally started setting it up and, you know, it was just in the stock 400s, then we went to the stock six and now we've progressed to super sport. And I had a plan of five years to have a team in every category in the UK. So we can take a young rider in 400s and if they win with my academy, they get a free ride the year after and progress them through the ranks to a super bike team. And the hardest thing is, you know, if they won stock six and I didn't have anywhere else for them to go, you know, it's hard, you know, even if you're a stock six champion, teams are looking for money to go riding. And a lot of the times the riders don't have that. So I wanted to create a stepping stone. If you won with me, there will be an opportunity in the class above. And that was for me, the main aim of this whole concept. And there is a time now where I think that I can make those stepping stones and to run a super bike team's a big ask, you know, it's a lot of financial support. And over these years, we've created a good hospitality, a good foundation. We've won two championships. We were first and second last year in the 400s. And we're now starting to get the interest from sponsors. And I do feel that we can put something together to make that five-year plan as such. And uh, yeah, we'll have to watch this space, but that is my plan. And, and that's what is I'm aiming to do. I look forward to hearing that. How much pride does it give you to see the Affinity Academy grow in? That it's something that, that you developed with your team and with the Haslam name and to see it progress over the seasons to having the, the squad of riders that you've got, it, it's gathered an awful lot of pace in a, in a short space time and championships to boot as well. Yeah, and um, I remember having conversations early days with Kawasaki and I was like, oh, you know, I wanted to take young riders out of Bemsey and, and Ovali championships. And it wasn't necessarily about winning championships, my concept. And, you know, oh, we can't support you unless we've got someone winning and showing our brand. And I had to change my view on that. So, you know, I've got four riders in the 400s and I want two competitive ones and two learning. So then it, it, it's a natural progression. And, you know, a lot of teams, you know, because having to justify it for sponsors and everything else, it's, it's all about, oh, we will be winning. We will get the best coverage. And for me, it was more about the upbringing of, unknowns you know give them an opportunity give them a two-year option in that and if they win there will be a, a step in the next category um so yeah honestly to win the two championships and i think it was 12 out of 16 races we won as a team last year and we we're so close many times over getting one two three on the podium um i think three times on the last corner of the last lap was one two three and we never actually got it last year so it was uh <laughs> but it was cool you know and and all the riders that's come through and you know yes is the team yes is the you know creating an opportunity from a racing point of view but my you know i would say input is more about you know teaching them with the training the diets the the pit biking and you know obviously ben come out for probably a day and a half before he injured himself last year just that sort of like living bikes you know and that and that's something i've been had my whole life and i you know i really love so if i can pass that on and show them what we do with kurt and, and all those sort of things it's uh I, you know that's the sort of thing that i'm trying to to give them as such um you know, yeah, and, and from my side of it, you know, to ride with young riders and try and help them. And my dad's heavily involved now with his experience. And, you know, we get a, an Olis technician and who talks to him about suspension. And, you know, we send him on PR um, activities to learn how to speak in front of cameras. And I think that's um, very overlooked, you know, and, and riding a lot in Spain and, and looking what they're doing out there from such a young age. And I, th I feel that, that, you know, from a, a UK point of view, that's something that we really need to push a little bit more. What's the criteria on on choosing riders? Do they come to you? Do you have your eye on people? Do you have kind of scouts out there that, that people who you know go, tell you what, Leon, this kid's got something. Uh, what's the criteria? Yeah, th there's always a lot of people. Uh, all, everyone's looking for opportunities, so we get a lot of people approach me. Um, you know, I'm actually really excited. I've not got, I've not picked a 400 rider that should win the championship next year for me, or this year, should I say? Um, I've got one kid out of uh, motocross. I've got two from the Irish Championship. Um, I've got Charlotte, who will be really good, who um, who's had experience in the class. Um, so I've got a, a wide mix of people, and it'll be interesting to see where they fall in results. Uh, where the Stock 6 class, we've upgraded all the people from 400s into Stock 6. Uh, we've up James, uh, upgraded James McManus into Super Sport after winning the championship for me. So I think fundamentally, there's is, is quite a lot of dynamics going on. Some's going to do really well to get in the points. Um, others I expect to be challenging for podiums. So, you know, you kind of got to treat everyone individually um, as long as they've got their own, you know, realistic targets. 
Um, and then you've got to take uh, positive, positive, positivity out of that. So that's the aim. Everyone's individual and we'll try and make them progress that way. You have two super sport bikes yep. this year with Eugene Jr. and James. Yes, Eugene and James are two brothers together. So the two brothers together and mm. they are, they're kind of the future of the sport in a little way, aren't they? The way they've grown through the super sport yeah. 400 into the super sport class. Yep. The, I mean, the dad was no slouch on a bike. He, no. was, he wasn't shabby, Eugene Sr. Yeah. What, what do you see their path going on? Just using those two as an example. Yeah, so the two very different paths. Obviously, Eugene had been racing a few years before he come to us, and he come to us after having a really bad injury at Brands Hatch, you know, pretty much career-ending injury. And um, he'd only done a couple of races. And he, the first year with us, with the Stock 6, it was a bit of a rebuilding him as a person, confidence, injuries. Um, and then he went to Supersport last year and podiumed in his first year in Supersport. So for me, him going into Supersport this year, second year in the class, um, using a different manufacturer, uh, I feel that he's at a point now where he can actually challenge for top threes, which for him as a person, I think that will elevate him quite quickly. Um, James, on the other hand, um, three years ago, never even rode a bike, any bike. So to get him out on track, like even just to slip a clutch was like a big thing. And, you know, Last year he won the 400 championship. So to upgrade him to super sport, it's a massive step and we need to kind of like hold him back. You know, you know, first year, even getting in the points is going to be tough for him. But, you know, if we can hold him back and he can learn from his brother and, and make the steps, I think, you know, he's, he's definitely a force in the future. Uh, sorry, Ben. Um, managing your expectations is mm -hmm. obviously a difficult thing like you just touched on. Mm -hmm. um, obviously having your own expectations with your own racing, is it hard to manage the two and balance the two as in your team manager on race weekend or mm. team owner mm. as such? Obviously you would have the correct people in place to, mm. to do the managerial sort of stuff on the race weekend, but is it hard for you to separate from that and balance the two on race weekend? I, honestly, I'm, I'm quite good at that. Um, I have got some very good managers over each concept. I've got my dad who helps from a teaching point of view. So I'm ticking the boxes what the team needs um, without actually having too much of my time or input. Yes, I have to set it up originally and I do get involved in the training camps, but I'm doing that regardless if they're or not. So I am good at switching off from that. Managing my own expectations, as you know, me is probably not a, a strong point. I can tell them to be one way, but I obviously act the other way. You know, I expect to win every race. And uh, when I don't, obviously, I don't probably react in the best way. But um, yeah, you know, obviously teaching from my mistakes and trying to help them one way and then me actually taking my own advice is probably the two things that I struggle with. <laughs> you go on, Zay, sorry. Uh, that's an interesting concept because you, you are one of the most driven and motivated riders, I think, in the paddock. You, you are a perfectionist in in terms of drive and you want to win every race that you, you enter mm. how do you meter that back and and because it's been instilled into you since you were so high and now yeah. trying I, to bring that forward i do get a bad rep you know I, i'm renowned for kicking off every now and again and stuff but yeah i think the best quote i think was from jack valentine actually it was team manager with me and i think we won both races at round one and we had a two and a half hour meeting and I was moaning and complaining about everything. And Jack's like, he's looking at me, he's looking at the mechanics. And I was like, did we not just win both races today? <laughs> do, he's, do his accent for us. Do <laughs> his know, accent. You're the accent, man. <laughs> but yeah, no, he was like, I, I don't understand. We've just won both races. We're here for two and a half hours about everything that's wrong with the bike. So <laughs> no, I, I, it's not a perfection thing. It's about, you know, we spoke about it with Kawasaki and not sitting back, you know, and even if you win a race, there's areas that you can improve on and, and myself as well. And, self-analyzing that and if we can't achieve uh if i need a certain part and we can't have it i'm quite easy to accept that and then let's let's focus on something else but if we can get improved then i'm i'm, I'm the one that's going to say it <laughs> would you like to manage yourself if you uh, if you were the manager and as, as a rider what no, how would no, you be a I, I'm, i know i'm a nightmare i, I know i am i'm not, I'm not <laughs> that. we had jack valentine on the podcast actually just recently and we actually touched on your 2018 season a little bit but it was actually 2017 which was the mm. the catalyst of everything really because mm. the, after the disaster that um happened at brands hatch where obviously brakes failed on the on that last weekend you've you've got a commandable championship lead and it all just mm. um went down the drain now i don't want to focus too much on that however jack said one thing to me which mm. really stuck in my mind is you broke your ankle you mm. smashed to pieces you jumped off the thing at the mm. back of <laughs> The back straight at Brands Hatch yeah. at Hawthorne's one of the fastest sections mm. in you know in the British calendar. However, a mm. couple of weeks later, you're out mm. 
you're out testing um, at Guadix, I think it is, mm. and you're getting ready for that next season, which mm. ultimately ended up being mm. your British Championship year. Yeah. As you get older, mm. h- how do you find the motivation to want to go out testing, doing hundreds of laps after such a demanding season and mm. especially the 2017 season when it all went wrong? Yeah, honestly, I think it, it was tough, but at the same time, I was very confident in my ability. Even in 16, when we lost the championship, I was, I knew I could, I could win. I knew I, I not won a championship. And for me, that organization and the things that went wrong, it was just ticking off boxes. So, you know, experienced teams who win championships, you know, eliminate all those little things. And hence why I got so heavily involved in the management side and the testing side of it. And I'm, I'm the sort of person that I'll sit up with them till 12 o'clock looking at data because I need to know that they understand what I'm saying and that they're going to do the thing. And I had a real good bunch of guys that worked, you know, unbelievably and Jack worked massively. And after losing that championship, I felt that it was taken from me. So I remember lying in hospital with a broken ankle and I said, right, we need to book a test. You know, we, we need to like make this, these steps. We wanted to do it all year. And straight away they did. And straight away from testing, we'd made a step from brands a year before and started that season. I, I knew that we could win every single race and, Every other year you're going into it, it's oh yeah, you know, we're missing this, we're missing that. And the things wasn't quite right. And it's more of an organizational thing than it was about performance. And once everything was together and everything worked as it did that year, we, we didn't have one DNF, we didn't have one blow up, we didn't crash at one race and we won 15 out of 23 races. And I didn't improve as a rider. The bike didn't improve, but it was stable and worked everywhere. And, and that's what changed in winning a championship versus not winning a championship. And I think that is the key of, of management and running teams is not having the fastest or best of everything, but it all just to work as it should. Is the motivation still as high? Yeah, I, I think there's, um, I don't feel like I need to prove myself as a rider, but at the same time, you know me, I'll, I'll be here, you can jump the furthest, you can do this the best. And I think that motivational side of it from performance is always going to be there in me. Um, I have got to step back. You know, we spoke about who, would would I like to manage myself, and the and the answer is definitely not. And you know, and that's why working with team managers, working with people who to do their job, and sometimes I have to bite my tongue because I am heavily involved, and I need to just be a rider. You know, and hence why we employ a lot of good people to do their job, and I sometimes have to let them do it. And even if they're not quite doing it, I want them to. I've got to sit back and let them do it. And and at the same time, I think that allows me to be a, a better rider as well. Have you scared a few uh, crew chiefs away over the years? We've had a, we've had a few <laughs> alterations, I would, I would like to say. But um, yeah, no, I've, I'm old school way. And I'm, a lot of my upbringing of um, what is a very good team was actually back in the airway days with Colin Wright. And, you know, he was all about taking, um, you know, accountability for every person in the team. And if you don't win, or even if you do win, what do you need to be win by more? And whatever that is, it could be that, I'm not sleeping at night. It could be missing this off the bike or the mechanics aren't working in a good way. And it was making it everybody accountable to make the difference to go forward. And that first year, two years, we had so many blazing arguments. But as soon as that meeting had finished, there was a solution to be better. And we all went for a drink and we was all fine. And I like that mentality. And sometimes those blazing arguments don't kind of work with certain people because they can take offense. But I'm not a sort of person that will take offense that like you can shout and scream at me. And as long as there's an outcome at the end of it, I'm, I'm happy, you know? And, and sometimes you've got to manage that and there's certain characters of people to get the best out of them. And that's something that I've learned over the last few years, but I'd rather just scream and shout and a solution to be made rather than like beat around the bush sort of situation. <laughs> but that is a little bit of me. And, and once everyone knows me, then we can move forward. <laughs> Was it that organization that you got involved with with the team and in the championship year has have you taken an awful lot of that into the setup with the affinity academy yes yeah, appointing the right people you know and um it hasn't been easy you know i've never really been in a position to manage and employ and, and get all these people together and you know staff is the biggest problem and um it's some even sometimes the, the better staff are the bit of problem because they've got their own ideas and thoughts and it's managing that and get it in a way where there's no no one ahead of anyone and every idea is a good idea and, and kind of putting all that together is is key. And um, yeah, it because I've been racing and doing World Superbike, while that's been going on, I've, I've kind of not been too hands on with it. And at the same time, you've got to release the reins for them to do it. And then sometimes it's probably not the best way. And um, 
you know, reconvening and making a better plan off the back of it. So it has took three years, but I feel every year it's progressed. You know, it's, it's proven it in the results. And, um, you know, we, we keep extending that into, obviously, hopefully to Superbike. Where do you see the, t the Affinity Academy in three years' time? You've done three years already. Where do you see it? Uh, three years, I'd like to have a representation in every class. Um, I feel that when it is established, you can have driven professional winners in each of those classes and then have some younger, less experienced rider alongside them. Because I feel that really helps that that person from behind. Um, and at the same time, it brings in a bit of new light for someone that is winning. You know, you're never going to be the quickest in every corner. So to have a young kid bringing some new eyes to the project is, uh, is also good for the experienced rider. So that sort of concept, um, championship in every class would be nice. That, that, that is the ultimate aim. It's the ultimate aim from there, isn't it? Without a doubt. Your championship hopes this season, um, knowing what you know, the package that you're on, um, what are you looking for? Are you are you going out there to win the championship? Obviously, you're going out there to win. Um, but with a new package, new team, what is realistically a great? Um, uh, what would I say? Uh, what would what would yeah? What would fulfil your expectations? So to me as as a rider, yes, I'm going to win. Obviously, I'm going to win. That is my aims. That's what we're aiming for. As a team manager, again, it's about managing expectations. Um, got to understand where we are, you know, to be top of your manufacturer of, of the people who's on the same bike is the first aim. Um, obviously creating something from new and I know there's going to be a lot of teething problems. So to win a championship, it's about consistency and everything else. So we have to be realistic. Um, I, I am quite confident in, in what we are going to produce. Um, Testing is going to be probably a bit better understanding of where we are. Um, but yeah, if we can win races and, um, you know, be the top of that manufacturer in the championship, that is the first aim as a team. Um, from my point of view, we want to win. <laughs> are, you, are you excited about your new venture with the new the new package? Is it something that you're really looking forward to? You've, you've got a history on that mm. um, manufacturer before. Mm. Are you yeah. looking forward to going back? Yeah, there is. The, the, there's a lot of things that in racing, you know, you can ride for some of the best teams, but if there are certain restrictions or limitations in, in whatever team you're riding for, as a rider, you can get frustrating. A lot of my frustration in the past is that, you know, it it doesn't matter what budget you have, it's managing that budget in the best way you can. And if you do do that and it's a fifth, then everyone can be happy. You know, if your expectations is third and you finish seventh and everyone's not happy and it's about managing those sort of things. And we've got to figure out where we're at and, and figure out where the expectation is. Um, but I'm very, very confident. And the fact that we have a little bit of a say and guidance of, of, of everything is is probably, I would say, more exciting than, than riding for someone that has a better expectation. At the moment, we can't talk about the team because it's not been released yet. So we'll we'll come on to that at a later show. Mm. Um, just coming away from, from the British Championship for a little while, Suzuka fascinates me. Mm. And you've had great success out there on on Honda machinery and on Kawasaki machinery. What what was the pull to go out there and do that? And what are your best memories for being out there? Yeah, I think as an individual race, I think it's one of the hardest races you can do. You know, the humidity, the the level, the competition, the fact that the, you know the Japanese manufacturers it's it's bigger than World Championships for a lot of them. And um, you know, the, the testing that you go to the you know, the budget, I believe, from Yamaha is bigger for the eight hour than it is for the whole World Superbike project. And that mentality, being involved in that, um, the fact it is a team sort of um, situation, you know, having one bike for three different riders. And, you know, you know, I've managed to win it three times. We've been on the podium every single year. Um, and there's nothing like being on a podium at Suzuka. You know, it's at night, you manage to finish and to obviously stand that above where everybody there at night is... Uh, is a special experience and obviously to win it was even better um i think it's the build up it's the team event it's um you know the competitiveness of it you know you get motor gp riders come you get world superbike riders come there you've got the world endurance as a a part of that uh, event as well so it's uh i think it's a collective of things um and yeah it's uh it's definitely a special event <laughs> have you got a story from suzuka that you've never told publicly before Stories. There's lots of stories from Suzuka. Um, this is where we get onto. I'll give you. I'll buy you a bit of time because this is where we get onto the bit that we did with Jack Valentine last week, where we had it. The, the story starts to come out, and then it brings another story and brings another story. And 
the, the story of the career is great, but the, the stories behind the scenes also is for the for the viewers, for the podcast, they're just those little stories that mm. maybe people don't know about. There's things that you can tell because there are plenty that you can't. Probably one of the best memories from Suzuka, which was a weird sort of situation. We, um, we led the Suzuka in 2019. Me and Johnny was um, just a two-man team. A top rank didn't ride. And there was a lot going on that year. And, um, you know, it, realistically, Yamaha as a package was a better package, and me and Johnny back to back to every stint, and and with one lap to go, we was leading it by 30, 40 seconds, and uh, Johnny crashed on oil, so the race got abandoned with a minute to go of the hour race, and we was deemed out of the results because we didn't make it back to the Palm Ferme, and, and in World Superbike rules, you have to get back within seven minutes, uh, as we know now in World Superbike, in World Endurance, that rule doesn't apply, so. I remember getting on a scooter, finding Johnny in a gravel trap, absolutely devastated that he'd crashed on the last lap of an eight hour race. And, you know, it is a tough race. And mate, it was one of them, like we just got out of there. We went straight to the bar. Uh, we ordered ourselves a couple of gins and we were just like proper, like down in the dump, <laughs> sulking. And uh, Johnny got a phone call, you know, oh, you know, they've protested it. That we've actually won the Suzuki Great Hour. And we was in a bar, you know, like out of the circuit. <laughs> and uh, we remember just like screaming and shouting and we, we ran down and we ended up doing like a, a ceremony just us on the podium and the press conferences. But like a uh, roller coaster of emotions is like, is, is another level, you know, from doing the race, thought we'd lost it, going to go and get a drink and then running back and obviously finally winning the Suzuki Great Hour with Kawasaki, which they'd never done before. You know, it was, uh, and I'd already, previously done three years with Kawasaki and finished second every year. So to actually finally win it for them was, was fantastic. So not only is the the last current rider ever to ride the NSR 500, mm. you are one of only two riders to win mm. Suzuka in a bar. Exactly. <laughs> He's won more races in a bar than you can imagine. <laughs> Tell us, Ben. Yeah. Funny enough, that's his specialty. <laughs> no, definitely uh, separating the... Um, the serious side of racing and then the, the the enjoyment side of things where you can sit back and enjoy those um, those feats. Obviously, it must have been tremendously heartbreaking to be commiserating that day, um, but then ultimately turning into such uh, such joy must have been something something else. It is, and uh, I want to touch wood here. Um, when you go and ride for a, a Japanese manufacturer, the pressure of not crashing is the biggest pressure you've ever had, not only because... When you're racing individually, if you crash, it's on you. Yeah, you, you're disappointed because the team's disappointed, but you've got three other riders, you've got all the Japanese. It's one race that they put all their effort into. So, you know, you say you don't ride at 100%, but to win, you have to. It's such a high level. But then not to crash is like, at touch wood, I've never crashed in a Suzuka race. So that to do it, I know that the pressure that that gives. So when Johnny did crash, like no fault of his own because it was oil. I, I knew exactly how it was going to feel. And it was like, it was like, say, a roller coaster of emotions. And, and it was, uh, like, say, a nice outcome. Touching wood may mean that potentially on the horizon there is another Suzuka 8 hour. Mm. Um, obviously, different manufacturer this year. Is that a possibility? It's something I want. Um, I did my first ever 24 hour last year. I absolutely loved it. Um, we led the uh, Bold Door 24 hour with three hours to go, and uh, we ended up breaking down. So, First 24 hour, didn't actually finish it, but um, what an experience. I really enjoy that side of it. The eight hour, the team event, and uh, I want to try and do a little bit more on that. Um, my main focus is going to be BSB, um, especially as we're trying to put all this together. Um, but yeah, more 24 hours, more eight hours, uh, that's definitely on the cards. So potentially we can see later on, in a little bit later in your career, potentially some endurance racing. Is hmm. I think um, we've already done a couple, and um, that's something that, my dad did and uh, it's something that I really want to do. Um, it's obviously creating a good package and getting all the other things that I'm doing at the minute not to fit in with each other, but uh, yeah, 100% as a, as a goal for myself, that's something I want to do. The endurance stuff fascinates me a little bit because I'm not very experienced in that sort of scene. Um, the Suzuka 8 hour with Kawasaki, you actually go over there to Japan and when you're riding with KRT, mm. you know, factory Kawasaki and World Superbike, alongside Johnny Ray, obviously mm. used to were number one and two mm. in the team that year uh, with top rack as, mm. as sort of the third riders because mm. he was on the Pachetti Kawasaki. When you go out there, you kind of expect it to be the same team, everything goes out there. Mm. However, that's not the case, is it? No, it's um, very strange. The first year I went out there was with two Japanese riders. So the bike was fully set up for them and I was just 
you know, an outsider that was filling in. And, you know, we finished second that year, but the bike was like completely different to, in my opinion, where it should have been. The second year they built a bike for me and the Japanese rider had to basically adapt to himself. And then when Johnny Ray arrived, it was a Johnny Ray bike and I had to adapt to that bike. And, and I think that is Suzuka as well, you know, you get a real tall rider and a small Japanese rider and you are riding the same bike, you know, where the levers are, where the footrests are. It's, it, it's such a, a weird thing, especially if you're very finical about how you have a bike individually, you go there. And that's the main reason why I went to race shift, you know, up until Suzuka eight hour, I was road, but I couldn't really, I couldn't ride race shift. You did majority of your career. is my GP shift. career road shift up until Suzuka. That's insane. Yeah. That's so my, unbelievable. Road shift. And when I went there, I was like, well, obviously we can't flip it backwards and forwards between riders. You're a typical motocross kid, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, proper old school way. And um, yeah, and then I had to change to to race shift purely just to do Suzuki Creole. So riders obviously know how finicky that is when some when a mechanic literally puts your mm. your lever back in the wrong place and you go out and practice and you come, what the what? Who's moved my <laughs> brake lever? It seems such a small thing, but it can be such a big thing. Yeah. Obviously, you've got to take that out of it with that endurance racing. However, mm. talk to me about the team side of things because mm. actual engineers and crew chiefs and people running it, all the personnel are actually completely different as yeah. well. So it's essentially a whole new thing. Yeah. And uh, the first years, I was, again, an all-Japanese team. Um, the last two years with Kawasaki was um, – uh, half KRT and half Kawasaki. Um, so and it's a mixture, you know, the, the main guy from Alex Lowe's was doing the fueling for Johnny, or basically as a team, and then Johnny had his guys there and some of the Japanese was there and all my development testing that I did um, last year. Uh, we had three weeks in Japan solid, which fuck, we did six days in Apollo Suzuka, just just me and, and not in the Japanese and just me on track as well. You know, it was like, very intense, you know, we're testing this item, we're testing this item. And I actually enjoyed that, you know, it was to have 18 people just for you and, and attract to yourself. And it was, uh, you know, it's, it's cool. It's a really cool thing to do. You must really love riding motorbikes because I know you've got a lot of riding coming up with track days and, and what have you in Spain and, and getting dialed on the new bike. Mm. Um, you know, personally for me, doing millions of laps doesn't work for me because I'm very much a... Mm. Uh, what's the best word put in it? I, like, I get excited mm. and I, I want to go super fast. I just want to ride on the limit and mm. I can make a mistake. So I have to kind of protect myself from that. Mm. Now, sort of just looking at that, does that lend you to being a fantastic test rider? And is that something also post-career maybe that you could look at? Yeah, I think even my roles with the Kawasaki side, uh, even last year when we finished second with KRT in eight hour, majority of the leading up to that, I was the test rider for the eight hour. Um, I wasn't even potentially going to be used. It was going to be Johnny and Alex. It was only because I was competitive that obviously I was used and, you know, we did four stints in the end. Um, so yeah, I think that side of it is something that I enjoy. I think that the feedback and working with the engineers and even down to, you know, when they brought ABS brakes out and doing the development for that and with, BMW 10 years ago, we was developing, you know, traction control and, and all those sort of things. And I think that is an excitement for me. Um, fundamentally, it's so I can go faster and win races. But at the same time, the process of that, you know, is really interesting. Do you see potentially something out of the ordinary and in going into MotoGP and maybe doing a test ride role there? You see the riders, obviously they're on a good screw and mm -hmm. they get to ride MotoGP bikes. They might do, you know, five, six tests a year. Yeah. Um, maybe a wild card in MotoGP. Is that something that's a possibility? Yeah, maybe. I, th I, th I think the racing is the focus point. So you don't mind doing all these laps and tests if it's for a reason. To just do all them laps and tests and not get to race it at this moment in time. Right now. Right now. Right, right now right, speaking. Right How about, now. what about three, four, five? Uh, three, four years, then 100%. You know, if I get to a point where, you know, I fell out of love with the actual, you know, the training twice a day, every day and racing and stuff, I, I'll always want to ride bikes. You know, my dad's 66 and he does more track days and riding than me. You know, yeah. he's got his CB500, he's doing cadwalls and everything else. So, you know, his passion for riding bikes, I believe is the same as mine. And um, I hope I've got as much passion as he has now in, you know, in 16 years time. But um, yeah, from my point of view, that side of it is, um, you know, I like riding bikes, you know, and when we go to Spain, we're riding motocross, flat track, pit bikes, um, one day, here, I think in the winter, we, we bought a load of scrap 
mopeds disconnected all the brakes and we had races around the field you know what i mean that's the sort of thing that we get up to and and, and that's for me it's it's riding bikes and um, and having fun of all the testing that you've done and the development over the years and on the on the different manufacturers what's the one biggest thing you've come across that you've gone yeah this works for me this is how this is what i want to develop further um the first time I got to try traction control, um, it was 2006 on the Airwave Ducati. Um, we flew out to Kyle Army, uh, a BSB team. Uh, we flew out to Kyle Army, just me and Gregorio on track, and we got given traction control. And it absolutely blew my mind. And it was, I come in, I says, I can't crash. It's physically impossible to crash. I was, it was like, I remember just thinking like, this is ridiculous and experimenting with it and how far you could push it to, always being careful and coming off of obviously two straight 500s. It was like, oh, if we had this on one of those bikes, it would have been, you know, and then also then exploring on how you then ride differently with it and yeah. how to use it and understanding how to go fast with it. It was, uh, for me, that was the, the, the biggest thing. Is that had, did that lead on then to the biggest adaptation of your riding style then from going from mm. no traction to traction? Yeah. And also, you know, the last few years I've been jumping world superbike to BSB and, um, it is so different and as much as i like a bike with no traction control because it is more about the rider and it's about feel and understanding that i don't think it's lending itself to move on to world championship because it is a completely different way of riding and also half the battle now in world championship is working with your electronics guy on how to set the electronics up to go fast but you don't get that experience when you've got a bike with no electronics so there's a little bit of a thing there that I believe needs looking at because it's about developing young riders to move on to world championship and adapting the style in the correct way to go to world championship. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how Brad gets on, you know, he absolutely annihilated everyone last year, but now he's going to go to the, on the same bike, but with electronics, you know, versus Tom Sykes, who, who basically finished 12th or 13th in the championship, who's going back to world championship, who knows how to ride electronics. And I think you'll see like one's going to adapt very easily and the other one's got a lot to learn. And I think from my side of it, that that'll highlight probably the changes that's needed in BSB to, you know, help the riders progress to world championship. That's an interesting, that was going to be my next question mm. about how you think Brad is going to fare because the Yamaha mm. is quite reliant on specific electronics, mm. um, which the Motec that he used in BSB to then go to the full Morelli system mm. on the new team. Mm. What are the challenges what is he going to face? No, I, I've rode Motec with with TC working. I think it's the fact with no TC and also working with a technician of how to explain what is available to them. Uh, you know, the good thing Brad's got, he knows the bike, obviously he's won on that bike. Um, and the Yamaha as a package in World Championship seems to work for every Yamaha rider. So I think he's got a good opportunity. Um, you know, he needed to make that step. Um, you know, Tom knows electronics, knows the Kawasaki. So he's also got an equal opportunity to, to show his worth, I, I would say. Um, and I think Brad's got to take it one step at a time. Um, I think it is going to be a tough, you know, the championship's tough, you know, it's probably the toughest it's been as in the amount of people that, that are competitive. Um, but yeah, I think if he takes it as a learning year, learns how to run the electronics, learns how to work with the technicians, um, this first year will be a, be a learning year for him. Do you think um, with that, on that point, with the British Superbike Championship, with the regulations it's got, and then the World Superbike Championship with the regulations it's got, mm. are we kind of getting to the period now where there's so many good riders mm. that the jump all of a sudden, the gap mm. between British Superbike mm. and World Superbike has never been further away? And I say that in a way that not necessarily rider ability because mm. we, we used to see like the likes of yourself – Alex Lowe's was a, mm. a, a, I remember that mm. distinctively when he went to the first ever test in Phillip Island mm. on a world superbike, Crescent Suzuki, mm. um, very unexperienced team, mm. goes there, puts it mm. um, puts it on top of the timesheets, yeah. ultimately didn't work out for him, broke his leg, what have you. But I'm seeing it now being a little bit more difficult for people to, mm. to make that step. Do you think it's something to do with the regulations is it something that maybe Stuart Higgs and mm. Scott Smart these guys need to look at for BSB I, I think that there's always an adaptation of, of everything um I think now the horsepower that standard bikes are putting out there um you know is phenomenal um you know I, I tested a stop bike at Cartagena last week and I've lapped quicker around Cartagena on a stop bike than I have, have on a super bike so you know I think that the, that level and, and what is accessible now as standard 
I think to take all that away to run a British Championship is something that maybe needs looking at. And I think it will help the progression into Worlds. I think the biggest problem with World Championship right now is, is yes, you have the best riders on the best bikes, but the, the next step down on machinery, teams, budgets, everything is quite big. So unless you go on one of three bikes, I think it's really, really difficult to show a top five result. Um, where back in my day, I remember wildcarding and, you know, your Chris Walkers, your Hudsons could go and win and shake his, could go and win at a World Superbike with the BSB bike. You know, and for me, what an um, easy way then to employ that person to go to World Championship. And I think now employing a young rider that only is ridden in England with no electronic experience to be given an opportunity in a second rate World Superbike team, what are you really expecting them to do? You know, even if you put an experienced rider in that team, they're not necessarily going to be top five. So if you take an unexperienced rider there, it's, it's going to be a tough year. In terms of the business side of things with, with Stuart Higgs and um, MSVR Racing, BSB, obviously it doesn't make a huge amount of sense mm. to line the regulations up, marry them up, should I say, mm. um, sort of like, you know, perfectly with World Superbikes because then we might see the top riders disappearing mm. and it becomes a sort of a, a, a business decision. And, that, and that's me sort of just guessing in a way. However, does it become, is there a crossover there a little bit where it becomes a safety issue? Because we've got tracks like Cadwell Park and yeah. these sort of places where they would definitely not pass mm. FIM regulation to race on world championship. Like Brands Hatch, for instance, doesn't even pass that mm. test. Does it become a safety issue where maybe the implementing traction control could potentially save a lot of big crashes and maybe make it a bit safer for the racers? It might make it safer on, a, on an exit of a corner position, as it always does. Um, but I actually find with with a full electronic package, you ride harder. So you're going faster. So you go in, you're attacking harder as well because the bike allows you to. So on narrower circuits in the BSB, I'm not quite sure how that would fit. And also from the on the flip side of it, um, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a business decision not to align them. I think it was done for, to save costs. Um, you know, to have a electronic engineer in the world championship, just to have a decent guy, it's a hundred thousand, you know, to have full time role. Yeah. Such. So the restriction on electronics restriction of not having to have these people alongside you it, I, is the reason I, th I think why the BSB the way it is and to save money, to save costs. Um, so I think that is why the way it is, but Motec has a capability for traction control. If that then means you need a technician and then it ups the pricing, that I think that is the balance that you've got to look at. And um, you know, maybe put a restriction that you don't you don't need it, you don't you can't have a technician. I don't know. I don't know how it can work, but you know, um there's a lot of fundamentals and there's me as a racer that wants everything as to be the fastest you can, but then also you've got to look at the business side of it to to get people and teams and, and everything. It's a lot of money to run a team. So a lot of these restrictions on price caps on brakes and suspension and not being able to test in Europe. It's not to, you know, to help in their side of it. It's actually to help the team to be able to go racing. So putting the rider side, uh, right ahead mm. to the side for one moment and let's talk team manager um, sort of position. Is there a good communication with the championship in BSB to say, hey, Stuart, and I, look, I don't even know if Stuart's the guy you, you would liaise with, but... Mm. Is it like, hey, Stuart, um, have you considered maybe doing traction control, um, mm -hmm. pulling all the pulling all the teams together, um, having a a, uh, a meeting before the regulations are set, and sort of throwing ideas around the table and saying, what does everybody think? Mm -hmm. Because maybe the re the responses are a lot different to what we think. But mm -hmm. does that sort of stuff happen at that level? Uh, yes, hundred percent. I know that there's teams meetings with Stuart, and and that has always happened, and. Obviously, it has to be a collective decision, not only on the rules of the championship, but also the rules of each manufacturer and what's allowed. And and obviously, it does come down to budgets. So, you know, if Stuart says, okay, yeah, you can have full factory electronics, and all the teams are probably going to say, oh, no, we don't want that because that's another 200K they've got to find, you know. And and it is a compromise, and I get all that. Um, what has happened over over winter is we've set up a riders um, committee. Um, there's six of us that's been nominated. So all the riders are on the WhatsApp group. We all can express our feelings and the six nominated riders by the riders. Um, we meet with Stuart every Thursday before every event and, uh, you know, express all matters, you know, if it's safety, if it's, um, you know, rules of the championship. So that's something that I've been doing in world championship for a lot of years. And, and that's something now that's been implemented for BSB as well. So it's, it's quite cool. Who are the riders on the committee? Are you allowed to eat? Um, uh, I'm one of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, I figured that with the way you were saying it. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I think Pete's on there, Josh Brooks. Um, yeah, I, I've so the, to, um, the experienced guys in the grid. Yeah, and, and it was a voting system through uh, all the riders. So it was the riders that voted us forward, which you know, which is cool. You know, and a lot of the stuff that have, have been put forward have uh, have already been listened to by Stuart, and there are changes, and and then that's how the sport progresses as well. And you know, it's pretty cool that you know we have that sort of input. Nice. Sorry, I thought I was interesting. Do you know, you're, sometimes, you're deep in thought. I, yeah, sometimes you're just, just taking sitting, it all. I'm in. listening to you guys <laughs> chatting away, and this is, you know, this is fantastic. It, it's it's enjoyable to listen to two riders talking at the same time, mm. because that's one of the reasons that mm. we brought Ben into the podcast. Mm. A, because he's a great guy, but B, also he's a current rider, mm. so he can ask questions about things that I have no idea. Sure, um, I I have a, a, a general overview of, of what you guys can do, but no, the, the um, more on the technical side of, of the ability and the, the setup. Um, one thing that um, we we'll just move away from the, the the motorcycle race inside a little bit, and we spoke about this earlier on. Tell me about your meeting with Elton John. Elton oh, John, yeah, it was it was a long time ago. Um, I got asked at that time, I was doing quite a lot of stuff with a media company that was being used. I did a bit for GQ magazine and, and just photos and trying to build the, I would say, the the imagery for motorsport up. And uh, I know James Tozen did a little bit as well at the time. And I got asked to do a photo shoot. It was for the Elton John Aid Foundation. And, you know, yeah, no problem. I went to London. I didn't kind of know what I was getting myself into. And um, it ended up being a naked photo shoot, um, you know, fully trimmed up, body painted sort of day photo shoot. And... I think I thought I was getting stitched up a little bit, but <laughs> it ended up it ended up being really cool. Um, on the launch of all the the book that he made, uh, uh, which was like a Terry Henry, Venus Williams, all, a lot of top rider um, athletes that did it. Um, we did like a launch, and and the pictures got put in London art galleries. And uh, I got to meet Elton John, and uh, I remember meeting him. He, was, he had this purple suit on. And I was like, I've never really been uh, that starstruck, but uh, obviously meeting him was uh, definitely one of my tick lists. Is it something that, that you enjoy is building the, um, the the view of the sport building the, uh, because we're, we're not a mainstream sport mm. and you know the sports personality of the year we never really seem to get only the negative side mm. of the sport tends to get mentioned mm. but raising the profile do you enjoy being part of that raising the profile of, of motorbike racing i think it's everyone's duty to do it you know i think more exposure it gets easier it is to find sponsors um you know so it wasn't for personal gains it was more just because i think you you know obliged to do that to help the industry and and, and the up-and-coming riders you know as well it's i think it's all part of it and uh, some riders seem to miss that a little bit and you know, you have got to be a certain way. You, you are representing manufacturers and sponsors all the time. So sometimes it makes you a little bit boring because you you have to be very PC on what you say and how you say it. But at the same time, I think, you know, it's all part of it. And, it's, you know, it's very important. Moving forward, actually, with that side of things, um, the business side of the championship, the, mm -hmm. you know, World Superbike, BSB, all those sort of things. We're, we're, we're in a good place at the moment in motorcycle racing. Mm -hmm. What would you – do you have any ideas on maybe – um, Dave just touched about the mainstream. Mm. Do you have any ideas on how potentially we could make this sport blow up? Like we've seen the UFC over the last 10 mm. years, for instance, blow up sure. these sorts of um, crazy sports. Our sport is crazy. Like mm. it's adrenaline. It's mm. a spectacle when you go track side. Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever sat back and thought, Do you know what this sport needs? It needs a press conference with everyone in suits and talking shit about each other or is it <laughs> do we need what do we you know that's just hypothetical it, it's but such a catch-22 in it it's um i can see it from both sides you know i, I see like economy mcgregor's and i love to be like that and that, <laughs> that cocky and just like roll up but one you've got to back it up and also you're representing so many sponsors so like you can't say the wrong thing and you have to do this and you have to behave this way and, and it does take your personality away and there's some unique people that manage to keep the personality in and, and still say all the right things and then if you do say the wrong things then no one wants to work with you because you're obviously not representing the brand so i think because it is so corporate you know it's very controlled by tv and, and organizations that you know if you're too much of a risk they won't take you on um i'd like to see less of that a bit more old school let the characters come out in full swing and uh, see what happens <laughs> and then the viewings go up pay-per-view what about that sort of thing you know like a a, an online demand system for for BSB, for instance, like a, mm. I don't know what the the TV rights are, or what mm. supports that. Obviously, Dawn are doing a fantastic mm. job. Would, could you see BSB maybe going down that route? 
Yeah, I think, you know, I think you've got to bring a bit of personality back to it, you know, and I get the business side of it and it's a very big business from the other side of it. But to make it explode from a rider's point of view, I think you've got to, you've got to get the dirty stuff out there. You've got to, you know, see the, you know, what everyone goes through. And, you know, from my side of it, the the training and the fun side of stuff, you can make a documentary on all the fun things we do just on the, on the field here, you know what I mean? And I think that's what a lot of people want to see. Yes, it all entails to go racing and, and everything else but creating some personalities creating some uh, images with the young riders because they've all got a lot of uh, character and me as a team manager is trying to like contain that character but then me as a racer wants them to go and do exactly what they want to do so i'm a little bit split on that one <laughs> yeah. so. it's the the post-race interview for me as regular listeners and now viewers mm. on on the show for, the, for those who are listening on audio, make sure you head over to the YouTube channel, like and subscribe, and the guys are already here. Thank you very much. Also on the audio and the social media, there's a plug, got to get one of those in. Um, when I've worked with riders in the past, when you're on the podium, you're, you've got that privilege of being on a support class podium, fighting for your own championship. Mm. You have 30 seconds to get your personality across, and they spend 15 seconds of it thanking their sponsors. Mm. Do you find that as frustrating as I do? Or it, it, do you think yeah. that's part and parcel now of what we've got? Again, two hats. I think you've got, you know, it's very frustrating that they do do that because it just takes, it makes them very dull. Um, but on the flip side of it, I know the importance on how important that is for the sponsors. You know, having to like create this and with the sponsors and it's like, oh, you know, every time you mention my name, it's worth this value. And, and I get that side of it. But as an individual, you know, I'm you know, giving my riders bollockings because they've got the hats on backwards and they're not thanking the sponsors. But at the same time, that's why they're likeable. You know, it's like, <laughs> this is such that's a thing. You, when, such you, a when you look at, um, when Owen Jenner won the championship, yeah. he has a larger than life character. Yeah. And having that come across mm. on, <laughs> a little visitor, um, having that come across on post-race interviews for me, mm. you, we can see what's on the leathers. We can see what's mm. on the top here. Mm. But to have 30 seconds of going, yeah, and I cut underneath him and he came back at me and he did mm. this. Is that not a better advert for the rider than thanking the sponsors? I, f I find it just difficult. Yeah, it is. And I fully agree. And, uh, and I think if you could just be yourself and personal, mm. I think it would be more attractive. But then at the same time, you know, it, riders are having to find money, find sponsors. And if they've got one sponsor that's allowed them to go and ride their bike then they're obviously going to be grateful and of want to do that. So, you know, they're actually probably that grateful that they've yeah. got a few quid to go race and they're going to thank them every day of the week. I, know, I, get, it, it's, it's, I get it 100%. Like, it's I it's think just, it boils down to in the yeah. end of the day, no riders, no show. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, no money, no riders, yeah, yeah. no riders, I, no show. And, I understand that, say, same as you, both sides of it. It's just some, it's the one chance they get mm -hmm. to show their character, to to lift the sport. Yeah, it's yeah. my podcast of the future, Dave. This is true. This is why we do what we do. Yeah. And it shows character. We've we've all got character. It, it's it's just nice to be able to express that and having you on the show as well to express mm. your character. I mean, you're one of the, the most mm. well-known riders mm. in the UK, and you do your GP and the World Superbike career. It's it's a pleasure to have you on. But you just yeah, it's just one of my little frustrating things. I get it, but you just think, oh, you had an opportunity there, yeah. and you spent twenty seconds thanking the people, which mm. is great for them. Yeah. And it might get them something for another year, but for the for the layman viewer, now mm. we're on free to air TV, mm. and people are watching it and they're going like, "Oh, mm. I think that's where, like what Leon was actually saying, balancing that mm. with uh, you know rider ability, but also the PR side mm. of things, mm. getting that nice balance where you can talk, you can show your your um you you're know relaxed. your character, yeah. you're relaxed, but mm. then also do the just slip the corporate thing in there mm. and you can see some of the, the you know, you can tell when someone good's doing it, they do it mm. and it just goes without notice. And mm. rather than do the big billboard and like, mm. oh, I want to thank and get your paper out and go, okay, I'll just yeah. wait a minute, I'll just read these ten sponsors out and we can move <laughs> on. Shaky was really good. You know, I found that he come across quite natural. And I remember pissing down with rain somewhere and they did an interview and he had his shark helmet and goes, I'm glad I've got my shark helmet because it's raining so much. And it's, it's getting across a jokey sort of way without saying, oh, thank you for my helmet. You know, it's like it's subliminal. It? Yeah, yeah, it is that. Yeah, without this best kit, I wouldn't be able to do yeah. what I do. And you've been in those situations yeah. as well with the kit that you have. Mm. Um, I just, uh, I've got a couple of little questions, little side questions that I've got down here. Um, what scares you the most? Um, white flashing lights on two strokes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, for sure. It's not the only thing that nips up. <laughs> I think the scary side of it is, 
I don't really look at it as it being scared because I feel privileged to do what I'm doing. I think it's about, um, you know, not being able to give my best, you know. It, you can go out there and ride around and if you're restricted by whatever it may be and and you, if I can give my best and I finish 10th, I'm, I can be half happy, you know. it's If, you, if you're not being able to give your best, I think that's a, the biggest thing that I want to be able to always do, regardless of where that makes me finish in a race. You're going to mention crocodiles, aren't you? I wasn't actually. I, <laughs> I, I, I left that in that face. first podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I left that in that first podcast, Dave. <laughs> also, what do you do to relax? I should have picked that up rather than looking down. Uh, lots. Um, you play a lot of do golf. You, do you get time to relax? I like beating him at golf, actually. That's quite <laughs> an entertaining, relaxing thing for me. Oh, really? He doesn't relax on a golf course. I've seen him throw a seven iron. So why am far. I not surprised? <laughs> I have am I I've been known surprised. to throw a seven iron further than the ball. <laughs> <laughs> However, normally it's because he's wound me up. But I would say my records, I reckon, in favor of winning than losing. No. Okay. How, can, how can you do that? By you, winning. But you've won more games. I think I've won more games. The only thing he won was how far he could throw a Yeah, game. exactly. That's, I remember that's London not Club. A competition. London Club, uh, Brands Hatch, prior to Brands Hatch, 2018. Um, actually, no, I think you might have. No, no. <laughs> 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 it was on the 18th anyway. It was all down to the wire, but there's been some serious grudge matches on that golf course. To be fair, we don't talk for a couple of weeks when we leave <laughs> golf courses. <laughs> When's your next game? It needs to be soon, actually. I'm uh, actually going out to Spain soon, so I'm a bit of sun. I'm not too keen on the wet weather and cold weather at the minute. No, you could. we could do without that. We, we've got plenty to, to go on, on that side. Mm. These rock stars, yeah, eh? They just oh, mate, float in no between idea. Spain. And I tried that once. It, it doesn't work for me. Spain. I have absolutely no idea on how all this works. I'm just, I'm just a podcast host. Um, what we do have, we have a Telegram channel. Um, and before we come down, we always ask the, 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 the guys on, and girls on Telegram, give us a couple of questions and they were coming down to see you and we, we have a couple that have that have come in um one isn't particularly a question one is is an observation um and you can bring the stories on from this but um from, from uh, one of our great listeners steve paul um he wants to know your best stories about having carl buckle as your motorhome driver oh yeah i remember him actually yeah uh, i saw him not long ago actually i think he's working with honda into now again into yeah yeah um yeah, when he was my motor driver, obviously I, w I was underage, so I couldn't even drive. And I remember like he was, he was pretty much like um, a parent to look after <laughs> me. It's like, and you know, Carl, obviously, definitely not a parent figure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, probably a lot of the um, the funny stories probably can't even be aired on anything, to be honest with you. It was more <laughs> him trying to look after me, but obviously not in a parent way. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of um, questions that, from Craig Lowe that we've had, and I think we've covered a couple of them in, having um, an extended run in a team rather than moving backwards and forwards between. Um, but what he has asked is, is when you look back from your career at this point, what's your greatest achievement? My Suzuka wins. My three Suzuka wins are, are definitely a big one. Um, runner up in the um, in the World Championship with Suzuki. I think they're the, I would say the two main ones. Obviously winning the British Championship is, is massive and, and how we did it that year was fantastic. Um, but yeah, as career highlights is is... The second in the, in the world with a with a Suzuki, uh, the three Suzuka wins, uh, and one thing that I'm, I'm actually quite proud of is is having podiums on every single manufacturer I've rode for. You know, six manufacturers and I've podiumed on every bike that I've rode. So to do that at a world level for me, I'm the only person that's done that as well. So from my side, it was been nice to jump on a, the seventh manufacturer that I'm not done and try and get one. But yeah, to, to have six, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that one. Excellent. And one one from from my other half, from Jennifer actually. Um, which paddock is the most fun away from the sort of off track? Because um, you've been in them all. Yeah. G GPs in my dad's era was, in my head, was the funnest time in a paddock. You know, everyone just, even on race weekend nights, you know, everyone playing and flying helicopters and, you know, in paddling pools. And it's obviously gone away a lot from that. It's gone very, a lot more corporate. Um, World Superbike, I would say, is probably the closest to, people socializing and, and also a lot of people stay on a Sunday night. So you get to actually relax. Um, me and Johnny's had a few Sunday nights together, which has been quite fun. Um, so yeah, I think, I think world superbike from that perspective, um, BSB is a, a, a fun paddock, but you're very much in and out, you know, a lot of people don't stay over. So the social side of it is less, I would say. Um, but in world championship, I'd say is probably the, the most chilled. Excellent. Ben? 
No. I said, you know, <laughs> this Nothing. Is, because this is our third podcast together. Mm. We're, we're going to get those cues eventually. And if you want you more from me, you're going to have to land an espresso on my lap here. <laughs> I'm tired from the, the training already. this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Been up since, you know, 4.30. Get, getting the yeah, true done. enough. Okay. Well, what we're going to do, just to explain to the to the viewers what we're going to do now, we'll round off with one final, with two final questions, actually. And then we're going to record another show, which will go out later, which explains what's going to happen in BSB 2023 for Leon. Um, but two final questions. One, I think we asked, um, did I ask this of Mark Woodage? I didn't get a chance to ask you this. Um, this is another one from, from Craig Lowe. Would you rather fight a chicken every time you got in your car or a monkey randomly once a week? That's a big one, isn't it? We've got chickens, actually. We're, I'll tell you who's scared of chickens, Sam Lowe's. He's <laughs> absolutely terrified of chickens. So, yeah, if he hears that one. But, yeah, probably the chicken. I don't mind chickens. I, mean, I wouldn't want to fight one every time I got in my car. The, the random monkey thing works for me. Well, we get fresh eggs from them every morning, so I have to kind of throw them off the <laughs> nest and get the eggs for the morning. You're already in there yeah, anyway. You're, you're already ankle deep in that exactly. anyway. What about you, Ben? I'll ask you that one. Um, you've asked me some dumb questions before, but this Mate, might we be want to just catalyst. got started. <laughs> this might be the catalyst. <laughs> Um, I'm answering it, am I? Yeah. Um, I have to actually think about this now. Uh, I'll probably just take on the chicken once a week. Uh, sorry, the, the monkey once a week because I get in and out of my car all the time. I can't be bothered with ripping a head off a chicken every single time. But I'll definitely boot a monkey into next Friday if he comes at me. So once a week, that'll do. And the, the final question that we ask of every guest, what's your best hire car story? Um, it's probably an Airwaves year that one would have been. Um, I remember... Last day of the test, we've been testing for like three weeks and I was driving Colin Wright's hire car. Um, I thought I'd take the boys out for food and a, a few beers. Obviously I was driving, so I was driving them all back. It was probably at one, two in the morning and um, the car was full and there was all kind of, I had a few drinks, the boys, and one of them whipped the handbrake on and it put me sideways. I couldn't get it off and it, it launched me off the side of the road, like probably only like a meter drop, but onto the beach. And it was my first year with Colin Wright. It was his car and I was absolutely shitting myself. <laughs> All the guys was that pissed. They were throwing sand on the car, trying to bury it. You know, it was like, <laughs> it was just one of those. And I remember we got a, a dustbin lorry to tow us off the beach. Cause like, it was about four or five in the morning. We finally got this car off the beach and we were going back to the airport the next day. As we opened all the doors, all this sand just come out of the car. <laughs> so, so yeah, from uh, me absolutely bricking it, having to explain this to my new team boss. And uh, yeah, it actually wasn't my fault either. Someone else had did that. <laughs> and what a team boss to have to explain it to. Yeah, exactly. But now it was all good in the end and we got the car back. Fantastic. <laughs> well, what an absolute pleasure. Leon, thank you for allowing us into your museum. Ben, did you want to? There we yeah, go. Yeah, it's it's like Stunned. Stunned. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Leon Haslam.